Hi everyone, this is Christy Grussman from the Orbiting Human Circus, and on behalf of the entire Orbiting Human Circus gang, I'd like to welcome you to Episode 6, and thank our sponsors, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans and Audible, who help make this all possible. But first, the Orbiting Human Circus is going on a short holiday break. Season 1 will resume on January 11th, so we wanted to wish you a Happy New Year now. We're so glad to have Rocket Mortgage as our sponsor, because for many of us, getting a traditional bank loan would be impossible. Take me, for instance. When I'm not with the Orbiting Human Circus, I'm busy spreading holiday cheer by doing high leg kicks in a beloved holiday chorus line. The old-time mortgage banking process is suitable only for a Scrooge. I need something that suits my world. I need a Rockette mortgage. Okay, it's not pronounced that way, and I'm not a Rockette. And we'd sincerely like to apologize to everyone involved for that joke. But do you think even Santa Claus would have time to apply for a mortgage the old-fashioned way? Why do you think he had to buy in the North Pole? Rocket Mortgage allows you to apply for a loan from the comfort of your own sleigh, and you can easily share your bank statements and pay stubs with the touch of a button, without even missing a kick if you were a Rockette, which I'm not, and which we in Quicken Loans are in no way affiliated with. So check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash OHC. That's OHC for Orbiting Human Circus. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS Consumer Access org number 3030. And now, please sit back and enjoy episode 6. When we last left the janitor, of course he'd hypnotized everybody. Yes, everybody. What happened next? Well, it's not quite in the holiday spirit. At least not in the spirit of a holiday episode, which this is. So we're going to spare you that and rectify another injustice we recently subjected you to. You'll remember that last episode the janitor began playing a feature presentation in John Cameron's dressing room. Look what I have in my bag. It's a feature presentation. And we didn't let you hear it. Well, that's what we're going to do now. It didn't go very well for him. What's he doing with the tape machine? Uh, why have you pulled the giant tape machine in this room? But we hope it goes better for you. On the tape itself was a photograph dated December 22nd, 1930. It's a photograph taken amidst the glow of a classic department store holiday display. And without further ado, we give you our feature presentation first night. I'm going to tell you about this kid. So you, you know those places on, on, on Park Avenue, those those beautiful mansions like, you know, the Morgan Library or something like that. Well, this kid lived in one of those places. But he doesn't even know he's living in a mansion on Park Avenue. He's that sheltered. All he knows is his aunt and his servants. This kid sees New York through a succession of windows. His big Park Avenue mansion or the windows of the limousine that takes him on the rare occasions that they let him out of the house. So this kid, Alistair, was like six years, I don't know, eight years old. The parents died in a car accident. The ants got all these rules and regulations. It's not like the ants a bad person. She loved the kid. I mean, the kid was all she had. But you'd never know it by, by seeing the way she treated him. And of course, he'd never know it. Okay, so it's Christmas Eve and she's gonna bring out the box. Now the box, once a year, it's like a ceremony. They open up the safe, they bring out the box. And to the kid, the box seems like it's magic. This is the one thing that his aunt is gonna actually touch. She opens up the box. What's in the box? Beautiful glass things that are gonna hang on the friggin' tree. And, and the thing about these ornaments are, I don't know, it's probably, you know, the uh, father's or the father's father's. Obviously, it's been passed down through the family, and it means something to her. I mean, she don't even let the servants touch them. They do everything around the house, but not this, not on Christmas Eve. Okay, so now the ornaments are out, and they bring in a ladder, and the aunt gets on the ladder. I mean, this is the only work she does all year. She gets on the ladder and starts hanging these little glass ornaments. And God forbid you get near one of these things. She'll rip your head off. And with each glass ornament she puts up there, it's like 
she's melting. It's like this ice queen, little by little, is thawing out. And when she's finally got that last ornament up, she looks over her work and she exhales and she says, now it's Christmas. And that's the one moment every year that the kid Alistair lives for. And there's one more thing. One year she actually let the kid out of the house and they drove to Herald Square. And I think it was, uh, I don't think, I don't think it was Macy's, I think it was Gimbel's. And they're shopping in Gimbel's, and the kid looks up, and who's there? Santa Claus. And she actually let the kid get in the line and wait there with other kids his age. And after maybe 15, 20 minutes, finally it was his turn. So little Alistair sits down on Santa's lap. And what does Santa say to the kid? You're a good boy. That's it. You're a good boy. Just you're a good boy. And the funny thing is that no one has ever told Alistair that he was a good boy. No one. So you can see why Christmas is everything to this kid. So they brought in this huge, huge Christmas tree every year. The favorite thing this kid can do is to climb under this massive tree and just be next to all the presents. Now, the kid's got to sneak and get under there because the ant has been telling him a million times, don't go near the tree, don't go near the tree. But he's small, so he can get in there, and he does it every year. So this kid's under the tree now, and something's not right. He's feeling woozy, and he knows he's not supposed to be under the tree to begin with. So the kid gets up loses his balance, and he knocks into the tree. And this is one of those big, rich people trees. And the thing comes falling down, and it just smashes every ornament, every ornament on that thing. And he's standing there, and the ant is, is sputtering. She's making these wheezing sounds. She says, you ruined Christmas. And she sends him to bed. On Christmas Eve, no less. And he drifts off to sleep. But it's a fevered sleep. And the ant's not heartless. She goes and feels his head. And it's burning. And she feels horrible. The kid has got 103 degrees fever. And she's a rich person. What does she do? She calls in a medical team. The doctors and nurses say, yeah, the kid is really sick. And she's got a problem. So he's laying in bed, 103 degree fever. He's having these horrible dreams that maybe he did actually ruin Christmas. And he actually dreams that his aunt let him go and play with some kids. And he goes out and starts playing with the kids. And they all turn on him. They shun him because he's the kid that ruined Christmas. And he wakes up in a cold sweat. It's 5 a.m. in the morning. He wants his Christmas. He's still in kind of a feverish state, and he just walks into the living room. And instead of seeing the tree, he sees all this weird medical equipment, and there's no Christmas there. And he doesn't know what's going on. Goes downstairs, he opens up the door of the mansion, and he looks out, and there in the gutter is his Christmas tree and all the ornaments. And he goes out, which takes a lot of guts for this kid. And there's all these Christmas trees laying in the street like garbage. And he thinks it's all his fault. And now he's really going crazy. And he starts walking a couple of blocks away. And he goes past an all-night diner. And there's a guy outside. And he's taking down all the Christmas decorations and the wreaths and everything. And the kid goes up to him and says, what are you doing? It's Christmas. And the guy goes, Christmas is over, kid. Good riddance. And he looks at him and he says, Where's your mother? Kid runs off. And now he starts wandering around the city. And this kid has never done that before. And he turns into an alley. And what does he see? A guy is laying there, passed out, filthy, cold, shivering, curled up in a field position. And the kid looks and he goes, it's Santa Claus. 
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We will return to our story in just a moment. Till then, take a break to enjoy your holiday cheer and listen to these words. Hi again, this is Christy. If you enjoy this feature presentation, we'd be honored if you would share it with any friends or family you think might enjoy it too this holiday season. We'd like to thank Audible for helping us be here. They really do help make it possible for us to bring this story out into the world, which makes sense since they themselves help bring so many stories out into the world. Stories that we here at the Orbiting Human Circus love and listen to, like the Turnip Princess and other newly discovered fairy tales, a collection of Bavarian fairy tales originally gathered long ago by a contemporary of the Brothers Grimm, lost and only now rediscovered like real buried treasure. The janitor thinks these stories are the best thing since sliced bread. So give it a listen if, like him and us, you love fairy tales and folklore and the great tradition of stories passed down from generation to generation. And Talking Birds. This book has those too. So do go get your free audiobook with a 30-day free trial specially offered to our listeners by going to audible.com slash OHC. That's OHC for Orbiting Human Circus. And know that by doing so, you're letting Audible know that you appreciate them helping us bring this story out into the world. And now we return you to our feature presentation, First Night. Okay. The thing is, it's December 29th. The kid has been sick. He's been sedated for four days. But he thinks it's Christmas morning. And the kid thinks he's found Santa Claus passed out in an alley. And he thinks it's his fault. He put him there. But what he's really found is me. You know, most of the derelicts wound up on the Bowery. But hey, I love Times Square. So I wake up and what do I find? There's a blanket on me. There's a hamburger from Needix and an orange aid. Now I don't know what the hell's going on. But I ate half the hamburger, I pulled the blanket over me and I went back to sleep. So I wake up again. What's there? Breakfast. What the hell is going on? And then I find a note. I can't re hardly read it. It's like a crazy person wrote it. And it says, the world needs you. We all need you. And it... And this kid comes out. And he's talking to me. He's pleading with me. And I can't make out head or tail of what this guy's saying. And this kid keeps on apologizing to me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And suddenly it dawns on me. This kid thinks I'm Santa Claus. I mean, yeah, I got the white beard, but I'm a Jew. And I also realized that this kid has been running around stealing stuff from me. And I'm looking at him and, hey, to me, he doesn't look right. He's pale. He's sweating. The kid's sick. So I asked the kid where he lives. And he keeps apologizing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I got to get this kid home. And he keeps telling me to go home to the North Pole. And he's getting flush. And I didn't realize that he's like passing out. And I take him around a corner to the 18th precinct. And I lay him on his steps. I ring the bell. And I run. I mean... I just don't like police stations. So I go back to my cardboard box. And for some reason, I can't stop thinking about this kid. And the next morning, I look at the Daily Mirror. And there's a big headline. Runaway rich kid found. And there's his picture on the cover of the Daily Mirror. And there's a picture of where the kid lives. And it's that big mansion on Park Avenue. And it says in the story that the kid might not make it. And look... I know you can't believe all the shit you read in the paper. So I find myself walking over to Park Avenue. I go to the servant's entrance, of course, and I knock. So the head of the kitchen answers the door. She thinks I came for a handout. And I tell her my story, and now she thinks I'm here for a really big handout. 
So she goes to get the ant, but meanwhile, I'm grilling the other servants to find out how the kid is. And they tell me that the kid is in some delirium, and he just keeps talking about Christmas, Christmas, and no one understands. So I split. Now, I got a brother-in-law in Jersey City. He does demolition and stuff like that. So I get on a train and, and go out there. I go to his house. I get cleaned up a little bit. And I do a day's work. And I go to one of those, you know, uh, costume shops they have there. And I say to the guy, uh, you got a Santa costume? And what do you know? It's half price. So I change into the thing right there in the shop. I get on a bus and everybody's looking at me like I'm just crazy. And I'm giving them all a finger. So I march right up to the house. I knock on the door of the service entrance. I demand to see the aunt. She looks distraught. And I tell her I need to see the kid, and I don't even wait for an answer. I go find where he is. So I go up to him, and I put on my best Santa voice. And I tell him I'm going to go straight to the North Pole, and I'm going to bring Christmas back. And I tell the kid everything he wants to hear. And the aunt is in the doorway the whole time, and she's watching this. She turns around, and she runs off. And she grabs every servant in the house. And all of a sudden, she's like Stalin. She's giving out orders to everybody. She's got the whole place in an uproar. And in five minutes, she's got them bringing in a tree. And she makes a Christmas for that kid like you would not believe. She makes a Christmas for that kid. And I slip out the back door. The kid got better. Broadcasting from the top of the Eiffel Tower, the orbiting human circus of the air. And that's how the tape ends, ladies and gentlemen. This is not John Cameron. He's still frozen in a hypnotic trance. This is the janitor's narrator saying, while there's still a chance, the orbiting human circus wishes you a good night. Hey, microphone. I'm outside of my closet. Anyway, I'm going to lean you up against the closet door. The thing is, sometimes when the sauce think I'm not there or I'm asleep, they actually sing. Like, in my closet. I can just feel like when it's going to happen. Like, you know, like, you know how some people can tell when it's going to rain? Like, I can just feel it in, in my body. And, um, I think it's going to happen now. Um, so I'm not going in. I just thought you, sh you should hear it. <sighs> Bruh. I'm not too cold. I've got this jacket. Mr. Cameron gave it to me. Oh, listen, it's the sauce.
A sincere thanks to Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage's fast, easy, and completely online process lets you focus on steering your sleigh through the fog. Check out Rocket Mortgage at quickenloans.com slash OHC. And a big thanks to Audible for supporting our show and helping us share this story with you. For a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial, go to audible.com slash OHC. Happy holidays from all of us. We'll see you all again in the new year.